Hello, folks. Welcome back to a new week on World War II TV and our second round of Railways shows on the channel, which um, proved to be quite um, popular the first time. Joining me once again is HGW Davy to talk about German train operations in the East. So without further ado, I'll bring him in. Good evening, Hugh. How are you today? Hello, Woody. I'm fine, thank you. So it's a massive, massive subject. We were just talking before going live that, you know, we, we, you were helping me find guests for the Railways Weeks, and we, we, we kind of... Got to hit a few brick, brick walls of finding some guests, but we will get them later on. So you've kind of condensed the present down, presentation down to a sort of a shorter length tonight. Yeah, I mean, the original idea was to get two or three people to do sort of railways in Poland, railways in Germany, railways in the USSR, German railways in the occupied USSR, and sort of build it up that way. But um, we were unable to find academics or anybody really to talk about this. And I did try hard. I, I asked all of my um, Polish contacts. I asked official Polish historians. Um, I spoke to the uh, Railway Museum in Warsaw. But I really couldn't find anybody to come on the show and do Poland. Um, so what I've done is I've dropped the USSR part of the talk. And we're just going to concentrate on the German railways in occupied Eastern Europe. So across Poland and across the occupied part of the USSR. I haven't included any of the other railways, so Romania, Hungary, or any of those areas either, although they play a part. So, um, so But it's such a big subject, we're going to have struggle to get through just the German occupied railways in Eastern Europe and how they worked and, you know, get some, some raise some questions about, you know, what were the opportunities for collaboration and what were the opportunities for the Germans that perhaps they missed? Mm. And hopefully people watching this from Poland and Romania and other countries will maybe come out of the woodwork and, and come forward with their papers they've written or their websites that they run. Because every week uh, I find new historians, some I find myself and some find me these days. So that's really good. So, folks, I'm going to hand over to you in a minute. Um, fire away with your questions as they come along and I'll try and deal with them. But I'm going to hand over to, to learn about railways in German occupied Eastern Europe. Okay, so I'm H.W. Davey, and um, I'm a postgraduate researcher at the East Centre, which is at the University of East Anglia. And I thought we'd start out with this picture on the left here, which is of Julius Dorpmüller, who's the Reich Minister of Transport, and he's also head of the Deutsche Reichsbahn on his appointment by Hitler in 1937. And that's Hitler announcing to the, uh, the press the appointment of Dorpmüller. Um, we've, uh, I've really struggled to get this presentation together, so I hope it's going to be okay, but really I wanted to give you a, a complete picture of the German railways in occupied, especially Eastern Europe, but I've mentioned a few parts on Western Europe, um, and you'll see why that's important a bit later on, hopefully. Um, so the structure of tonight's talk is we're going to look at the historiography, of course, always looking at the historiography. Um, and then we're going to start with the development of German railways in occupied Europe as a whole, right from the start of the war in 19, uh, the Anschluss in Austria in 1937. And then we're going to look at the German military organizations that are most closely associated with railways. And then we're going to look at Operation Barbarossa as a topic on its own right and perhaps re-examine it from a railway perspective. And then if we've got time, which I don't think we will, I've also got more slides on Stalingrad, but that may have to wait for another time. Cool. So the historiography, I've chopped the historiography into three bits. So we've got, first of all, the, let's call it the German army historiography. So classic sources, Van Creefeld supplying war. Rather dated, rather elderly now. Second edition was out in 2004, but still a good general starting point on, on the subject of railway use in warfare. And then we got the only study on German railways dur use during Operation Barbarossa by Klaus Schuler. It was his PhD, um, which he did in... 1985 and then it came out as a book in 1987 and then we also got horse roderer um his uh, book on the army transport service which i'm not going to pronounce because one of those long german words right 
And then the second group of material we've got is um, at the end of the war, the US Army conducted um, interviews with German officers. These were all POWs, they were held in camps. They didn't have any access to any papers. They had to rely entirely on their memory. But the great thing for you guys is they're all in English, they're all translated. Um, and these are the ones that are rele uh, relevant to the railways. You have to treat them with some care, though, because at the start of the program, which was run by Franz Halder, who was the um, chief of the general staff up until 1942, he wrote a memo to the, all the officers saying, don't mention the war crimes. If you mention anything about atrocities, blame the SS. And it was also tainted by what's called the Himmerod Abbey Agreement of 1950, which was an agreement between Konrad Adenauer, who was the Austrian Chancellor of the day, no, sorry, German Chancellor of the day, with the um, senior officers of the German army at the time. And his agreement was, was that the German government would downplay military atrocities in, in uh, payment for the German army officers help in establishing the Bundeswehr in for NATO. So because of that, you have this tainted history, of, which is known as the um, myth of the clean Wehrmacht, which I think, Woody, you've already done a show on. Yeah. yeah. And that was up until uh, really 1991. So we have to treat the, what the German officers were saying to the US historians with a bit of care. Right, so the next one. Uh, right, the next uh, set of historiography is the railway historiography. So we have Eugene Hahn. Now he's an official, a railway official, actually working in Russia in Army Group South. He's arrested by the Gestapo in 1942 on the instructions of the army, along with his colleague, the head of RVD Center, Reichsbahnrat Langsberger. They both spend time in a concentration camp. So, but he writes about railwaymen and the resistance. And then we have the uh, granddaddy of uh, historians on German railways, Alfred Gottwald. And um, he also writes about the uh, German resistance by railwomen to um, Hitler. We then have the semi-official history of um, the German railways in Russia, which was written by Hans Pottgeister, who was a junior railway official in the East. He worked in Galicia, I think. Um, and we also have ha Eugene Kriedler. Eugene Kriedler is an interesting chap. He ran Department L in the uh, Deutsche Reichsbahn, which was the military liaison department. And after the war, he went round all of his old railway buddies, collecting um, all their personal records that they held. And um, he gathers into an archive. Unfortunately, it's not catalogued. It's in the Bundes archive in Berlin. Um, and you can, you can read it you and get stuff out of it. Um, but as I say, it's uncatalogued and it's all paper. Hmm. But he wrote this book, which is a very good book, which is the um, railways in the area of the Axis powers during the Second World War. And then finally, I put in a final source, which is Holland Hunter. Holland Hunter is a particular favorite of mine. He's a US um, economist and he studied the Soviet transport. I think he started as a student in 1940. And his last book um, came out in 2013. And he studied all aspects of the Soviet transport system. So we'll be relying on him for descriptions of the Soviet railways where we need them. All right. So the development of, of German railways in occupied Europe, 1938 to 1941. So we ha I have a different um, viewpoint from my Zizewski. And Browning, Browning's the man who wrote the Holocaust book on the railways, mm. because they all treat the Deutsche Reichsbahn as if it controlled all the railways in Europe. And the reality is it didn't. There were different railway companies all over Europe. Um, an analogy would be air traffic control. When you fly across Europe today, you seamlessly fly from, say, London to Prague or wherever. 
and your plane is handled by what seems to be a seamless air traffic control. That's the picture that Browning puts out. The DRB controlled everything, which has some validity. But in reality, as an air traffic control, each air traffic country has its own air traffic control, and they all agree with each other, and they operate together. But in fact, they're all using often different systems. And that's what I that's what I look at. I like to look at the individual companies operating the railways. So 1938, the Austrian railways were assimilated into the Deutsche Reichsbahn. They're run down, technically behind the times, need a lot of work doing on them. 1938, Czech railway assimilated into the Deutsche Reichsbahn as part of the protectorates of Bohemia and Moravia. Um, the Slovak parts pay stay Slovak and independent. But again, they're a bit behind the times, lacking capital expenditure. And then in 1939, we have Poland. And Poland is divided essentially into four areas. So we have Danzig, West Prussia, which is formed into a GAU under Albert Forster. He's a Nazi, he's an old fighter, but he doesn't believe in Nazi racial theories. So what he does with his population is he just says to all the Poles in his area, you're all Germans, gives them the papers and they become Germans. Same applies to his railway workers. To the south of there in the Wartegau, that's the domain of Albert Greiser. He is a racial Nazi. So he demisses all his Polish railway workers and replaces them with German Deutsche Reichsbahn staff. Both of these areas are taken into the Reich as, as directions in the Deutsche Reichsbahn. And then you have the Soviet zone where the Polish railway workers are deported to internal exile because the Soviets don't trust them. Now, the government general, now this is a really important decision, the, and it, it doesn't seem a, an important decision at the time, but it actually turns out to be a real war, changing the course of the war. The right Minister of Transport's taken on all these railways, a lot of them require a lot of capital expense, and the Deutsche Reichsbahn is starting to feel the strain. So by 1939, he decides to protect the Deutsche Reichsbahn to carry out its core work within the Reich, the new expanded Reich. So in order to do this, he says, I'm not taking on all of these other countries, these new countries. Remember, Poland's been dissolved as a country, so he's now got new areas he's dealing with. So what he does is he sets up new railway companies in the east, and he uses existing railway companies, because their states are still in existence, he uses existing railway companies in the west, so the SNCF stays the SNCF. It's still got French railway workers, French management. It just has a layer of Deutsche Reichsbahn supervisors on top and then military control on top of that. Now, the reason this is important is these new little railway companies in the east have to stand alone using their own resources. Now, from time to time, the Deutsche, Deutsche Reichsbahn will come in and help them. They'll send engineering units from their own resources or German industrial concerns, but they'll always go back home again. So these little railway companies are quite weak and they lack the basis to grow themselves. Now this isn't an issue in 1939, but it will grow to become one as this decision is not revisited. So in the government general, we've got a new railway company set up. It's the general direction the Ostbahn and it's under Reichsbahnrat Goethes, who's the guy you can see on the right-hand side shaking the hands of the minister, Hans Frank, who runs the government general. He's the guy on the left. And he use, uses existing Polish staff with a minimum number of German employees for supervision. Polish rolling stock, Polish track as well. So we need to get our heads around this sort of geography. So the government general gets its income from customs dues and the operating profits of the GEDOB. Now, this is quite considerable after 1941 because you've got a lot of traffic crossing the GEDOB area, raw materials coming back from the USSR, SS traffic for the Holocaust. It's got about 7,000 kilometers, of which 1,700 is double tracked. It's got 7,000 German workers, 1,500 Volkdeutsch, 
they aren't really trained because the Poles didn't trust them, so they never trained them as railwomen. And you've got 121,000 Polish railway workers. This is all on 1st of January 1943. And in 1942, it expands with the addition of Galicia, which is Lemberg, or as it's now known, Lvov or Lviv. So the Gedov is an independent railway company which coordinates the traffic with the Deutsche Reichsbahn. And the only time this independence is challenged is in 1944, when the, the Soviets are already in Poland and traffic demands dictate the Deutsche Ostbahn joins the DRB. However, this never happens as Frank always resists this because it's his main source of income. So to just quickly run through the uh, geography, Poland between 1918 and 1939 is outlined by the red line. It's made up of three separate railway networks from 1914. The old Prussian one in the northwest, the Austro-Hungarian one in the south, and the Russian Empire in the east. And in the intervening years, Poland joins up these three separate networks with linking lines. The only major new line is the French finance Silesian coal line, which is the dark blue one on the left hand side of the map going through the green area. This connects the Silesian coal fields with Genindia on the Baltic, which is the port which it exports the, the uh, coal so that uh, Poland can earn export dollars. The pink area on the right is the Cressy. Now, this is the region to the east of Warsaw and north of Galicia. Galicia is the bit outlined in the light blue in the bottom right hand corner. So the Cressy is sort of Bielestock, Sarny, the Pripyat Marshes. It's an agricultural area. The peasants are Ruthenes. The artisans are largely Jewish. And then you've got Polish landlords and administrators on top. And it regards, the Poles regard this as a sort of colonial area, frontier area, and a bulwark against the Soviet Union. So they leave this area deliberately undeveloped with railways. And where there are double track lines from the Tsarist era, they rip them up for 70 kilometers behind the border. Now I nickname this the Polish Gap. And it's 300 kilometers of low capacity railway line running between Poland uh, central Poland and the USSR. Okay, just a quick question for you, Hugh, about um, yep. people are asking about gauges and rolling stock. So an example one um, is, um, no, hang on, where is it? Where is it? I found it here. Scott Grimwood is saying, I'm assuming all these rail systems use similar rail gauge and rolling stock. That, that is that what it applies until you get to Soviet Union? Is that right? Mm, yes. Yeah, basically everything we've discussed so far is on standard European gauge, which is four foot eight and a half. Um, Poland, of course, wasn't originally that gauge. Poland was part of the, the Russian Empire part of Poland was originally five foot. Um, but it was changed over by the Germans when they captured it during the First World War. Right. OK. Rolling stock, every country has its own rolling stock. So you have Polish locomotives and you have Polish wagon designs. And when we talk about gauge, we need to be really careful because we're talk we talk about track gauge, which is there's lots of track gauges. And then we need to, to think also about loading gauge. Mm. So, for instance, I, I think we've discussed this before. If you drive a British train on French railways, it fits wonderfully because the British loading gauge is small, but you can't drive French rolling stock on British railways because it's too big. They have the same track gauge, but the loading gauge is different. Okay, and another one just about kind of basic, basic aspects. So Rob Crane is saying military control. Is that Wehrmacht, Luftwaffe or Kriegsmarine? Did they, in the usual Nazi way, end up tussling with each, with each other in terms of prioritization of movements? I mean, you mean, is it who, who is the military that controls this? Or, or is that so nice... KW controls railway movements and they're all under an army office and, the, he hand, and uh, they handle everything. That's coming up in a minute. Right. Cool. Thanks. Back to you then. Okay, so where we got to? So, uh, 
No, I think that's this is one. Right, okay, so 1940. So France, Belgium, Netherlands, they left their domestic railways and they just put it under military command with limited involvement from the Deutsche Reichsbahn. And then we have 1941, the invasion of the Soviet Union. Again, the Reich Ministry of Transport takes the view that this is too big a uh, piece to absorb into the Deutsche Reichsbahn. It's going to protect its core services. So it creates new railway companies within the occupied area of the Soviet Union. These are called RVDs. In chat, that changed their name several times, but we'll call them RVDs, which are right traffic directions. And these broadly align with the Reich's commissariats, although they, they don't towards the end. And these little railway companies are all coordinated by an office in Warsaw called GDV Austin. And that's the tr general traffic direction east. So which is what we're going to look at now. And you can see on the map here, you can see the RVDs. So you've got the um, army area, which is re rear area, which is relatively small. It's about 150 kilometers deep, which is quite small for the German army. Um, uh, and they, that area is run by what is known as the FEDCO, which is the Field Eisenbahn Commando, who we will um, perhaps look at a bit later on. Um, and then behind them, you have the civilian railways, which are the RVDs, and these are run by the Deutsche Reichsbahn. And the, their job is to move troops from Poland, from taking over from the Gedo, across Russia to the front line, move raw materials from the mines like Krivi Rog back to the Reich, and collect food from across Russia and move it up to the army. So in fact, there's greater traffic within Russia than there is going in and out of it. Um, the RVDs are quite, we're going to look at it in a minute, how big they are, but they are definitely underpowered for the job they're trying to do. Um, troop movements are affected. It's difficult to move troop, large bodies of troops across Russia. So panzer divisions, um, moving to uh, deal with breakthroughs, that's always problematic. And there's only really one big movement across Russia, and that's a Manstein's 11th Army, plus all the siege artillery, which has moved in 1942 from the Crimea up to the siege of Leningrad, which uh, Prit Buttar was talking about, I think, quite recently. Yep. So the... Um, Right, so we need to look at the relative sizes of the GEDOB and the GDV Austin. So in this table, we see the um, them on the 1st of January 1943. Now, in terms of track, GDV Austin is five times larger than the GEDOB, and this is matched by the level of indigenous personnel. You've basically got the same level of indigenous personnel in both. The GDV Austin was seriously short of motive power. It's only got double the number of engines or half the density, as in Poland. So it's short of motive power, and the Gedob itself was short of motive power vis-a-vis -vis the Deutsche Reichsbahn. So you can see that even though they're just trying to move military traffic and trying to do um, uh, just movements of food and raw materials, so they're not trying to match the economic activity of these countries. Nonetheless, they're probably really short of um, motive power. And the interesting figure is the last line, which is the number of German personnel. The GDV Austin required 15 times the number of personnel of the GEDOB, one German for every five Soviet workers. In the GEDOB, it was one for every 17 Polish workers. That's the effect of partisan operations. Mm -hmm. And given the, the, the Deutsche Reichsbahn personnel count was 1.4 million, that's quite a lot of um, personnel have been sucked away from the Reich to run these railways in Russia. So, have I gone twice? I have, yes. Right, so the um, next subject we're going to look at is with a little detour down a rabbit hole um, to the resistance in Poland. So we have in the partisans, the Home Army, Guarda Lerova, we are the communists, and the large number of associated groups, all of whom have different agendas. 
German reprisals for attacks on railways are extraordinarily harsh. And so there's a, felt to be within the Polish command a need to protect the civilian population because they understand it's going to be a long war for Poland. Also, the Home Army is conflicted about working with the Soviet Union and it decides it's not going to help the Axis. It will only act in uh, Polish self-interest. The communist partisans are not governed by this and they attack more often and in support of the Soviet Union, but they're a lot smaller than the AK. So we have a, li we have a limited number of attacks on trains. In 1940, about one a month. One to attack on a train a month in the whole of the general government. And this rises about one a day in 1942 and 1943. And then as the Red Army approaches 1944, a higher tempo of attacks. And I put on the right hand side the kind of level of damage that the Polish resistance managed to carry out on the railways. Um, and it's quite modest. And the bulk of this happens in 1944. So you can see that there's no real attempt by the Poles to interrupt German military traffic on its way to the Soviet Union during Operation Barbarossa, or even during the, the early years of the, um, the Soviet war. Right, so, so we have to look at, there, there's an idea in Holocaust history that people, you can divide people up into collaborators or bystanders. Nobody gets, uh, you can divide the population up. Either people help their resistors or they collaborate with the Germans, or they just stand there and watch who are the bystanders. And it's hard to judge the effect on railway operations of there's two areas, there's sabotage, which is blowing up railways, and then there's kind of intelligence work or, or uh, sabotage within workshops. So Polish railway workers had opportunities for direct sabotage of trains in sidings, in workshops, misdirection of trains, losing paperwork, and reporting on train movements to allied intelligence. The Genob has eight repair shops with 26,000 staff. There's lots of opportunities there to put grit in gearboxes and disable trains that way, that sort of thing. And we have to remember that most Germans in Poland are in administration jobs, and most of them are based in Krakow. So the actual level of supervision by Germans was quite low, with only 2% of workshop staff as supervisors, one foreman for every 50 workers, but they did occupy all the key supervision roles and they're backed up by a dedicated railway police force. So in reality, the, the prospects of successful sabotage, say in a workshop, without attracting reprisals was really quite low. And I put that picture on the right hand side because that really shows the, the, the dynamic in the uh, relationship there. You've got a German railway worker who's taking the tickets in the booth. And then beside him is a railway policeman. And they're obviously controlling the whole show. And then on the right hand side, you have the Polish railway worker who's very much in a sort of subservient kind of uh, position or subservient role. And then we have to, the other thing we have to consider is the benefits of being a railway worker. So the workers and their families receive a higher rate of rations, they get a clothing ration, and they're protected by the railway piece from interference from the outside. And they're also protected from Saukel's labor drafts in the later stages of the war. So it's a safe, cushy job with civil service status. So how aware were the Polish railway workers of, say, Holocaust trains? Well, I, I think as we, as you saw in the, uh, if you'd seen the other railway um, talk about the Holocaust, the actual number of Holocaust trains is one a day, and they're handling 500 trains, other trains. So it's probable that the railway workers were aware of the destination and the outcomes, but their chance of doing anything about it on this one train is probably quite small. And certainly the railway officials made sure they had German drivers on these trains and, made, and they had plenty of guards on them. So the railways are vital to keep Polish society running as well as the German occupation and the war effort and the military operations in the Soviet Union. That's the conflict. You can't shut down the railways. 
So if you had a general strike, you get huge damage to the civilian Polish population. The whole economy depends on the railways. The so food moves around with railways. And the Germans, if there, you ever had something like a general strike, the Germans would take massive reprisals. So with this special status, railway workers are shielded for most of the war. And to be fair, they're actually shielded after the war. Because again, the economy needs the railways. You can't, you don't want to upset these people. And why delve too deeply into it when there's lots of other issues to um, deal with? And their interference is not as measurable as partisan operations. So it's far easier when historians look at things to concentrate on the partisans than on the, the very sort of conflicted railway workers. So, oops. Right. OK, so German military organizations and the railways. So the first one we're going to look at is the Wehrmacht transport vessels. This is commanded by Rudolf Gurker throughout the war. He's a trusted by Hitler. Um, he stays in post throughout the war. His is a department of OKW. So it's not it's one removed from the army and it handles everything for the Navy. Every military rail movement is handled by them. And it's just very small. It's just a group of officers in Zossen, the headquarters, and key railway junctions have officers as well. It's largely concerned with strategic movement, moving the army from mobilization areas to frontier areas together with supplies. It's got a limited commitment to moving supplies forward from the frontier during our army operations um, onto foreign railway networks. It doesn't have many resources itself. It relies on the Deutsche Reichsbahn to provide the trains and drivers. It relies on the Eisenbahn Pioneer, who are part of the engineering corps, to rebuild and operate the railways and army rear areas. It got, had a conflict with the Deutsche Reichsbahn in the French campaign because it, the Deutsche Reichsbahn was slow to take over from the Eisenbahn Pioneer, which created friction with the um, army. The reason is, is because the, the idea of the Eisenbahn pioneer was that they wanted to run about six trains a day on a very basic setup, just using manual signals and basic repairs. The Deutsche Reichsbahn wants to run a proper railway. They want to run 36 trains a day on a fully repaired railway. And there's that mismatch between the two arguments about who's going to take over what. And so it's very slow. The other person concerned with railways is the General Quartermeister. <clears throat> this is Edward Wagner. He's a war criminal. He's responsible for occupation policy under the army in the army rear areas. In Poland, he organizes the SS to operate in the rear of the army. That's his responsibility. And in Russia, he's the order who orders the starving to death of three million Soviet POWs. He's got a big organization. It's well manned, well equipped, lots of equipment and things. And if you read the, the uh, supply manual, HDV 90, his armies were intended to operate 75 kilometers ahead of the railway. And he was covering this distance with lorry columns. And typically an army would have something like eight 60 ton motor columns. Wagner did have a strategic lorry force in the gross transport realm, the, the, main, the uh, main transport area. It's made up of three regiments. Two of them, ironically, are taken from a civilian company called Schenker, which is part of the Deutsche Reichsbahn. Schenker still exists today, and you'll see them driving around on British roads with a little red DB symbol, in, which is Deutsche Bahn, the German railways. And this supplements the link from the frontier to the army. Now, German logistics very much stress living off the land and ra rapid movement with minimal ties to the rear, carrying as much supplies as you can yourself. But even so, the, gro the gross transport realm is able to provide a limited additional support for the army. Relations with General Gurkha are not good. He's blamed for the railway mess in France and are not good with the Deutsche Reichsbahn either. So we're going to look at next is Operation Barbarossa. 
Right. So Operation Barbarossa poses something of a problem for the German military and for the railway authorities. Most German campaigns cover 300 kilometers advance. The uh, route from the Ardennes up to Dunkirk is about that distance, and the kind of areas that they're covering in the Polish campaign are about the same. So they're looking at a campaign, 300 kilometers, six weeks duration. But the campaign in the Soviet Union is going to be much, much bigger than this, more than double that. So General Gurkha, as chief of the uh, OKW transport, needs to move the army from France, where it's currently based, to Germany, into Poland, to deploy for the operation, together with all the stores and equipment. And it has to be done quickly, and it has to be done as secretly as possible to avoid scrutiny by the Soviets. But the railways in the east, particularly in Poland, in, particularly in uh, central Poland, lack the capacity to do this. So in April 1940, um, the Reichsbahn starts a program to upgrade the tracks. And to do this, they use 30,000 workers and 300,000 tons of steel. This steel had to come from the army allocation for armaments, which had been allocated for the production of ammunition and weapons over a period of three months. So this program is called the Otto program, this upgrade. So before Plan Otto, the railways in East Prussia had had three railway lines, which carried 36 pairs of trains a day and one of 12 trains a day. While the Genov had a lower track capacity, for instance, Warsaw to Bilir Stock line only carried 24 trains a day, and the Minsk line only carried 18 trains a day. While in the southeast, Krakow to Lemberg only carried 24 trains a day, and the total capacity was 198 pairs of trains a day. Remember, to move one division, you're looking at 70 to 90 trains. So that's about two divisions a day. And you've got 180 divisions to move, perhaps, into Russia, 120 maybe, if you discount the fact there's already units there. So it's a real problem. <clears throat> so the program produces eight trunk lines, which I marked on the map there. And they range between 24 tra pairs of trains a day and 72 pairs of trains a day. And they give a total of 396 train pairs on the border with the Soviet Union and 468 train pairs on the Vistula. So two and a half times the original capacity. This is a big expansion. Army Group North is supported by those three lines, the two uh, sort of red, uh, orange lines and the green line running through East Prussia with a total of 196 train pairs a day. And this is supplemented by shipping through the Baltic posts to Lithuania and Estonia later on in the campaign. Army Group Center has 168 trains. They're the two yellow lines and the green line in the middle. And then Army Group South has 108 trains and is supported by, um, so that's the orange one running along the bottom. And then this very strange blue line that starts off up in the top runs across the whole of the middle of Poland and ends up heading southeast. Now, while this capacity can be maintained for mobilization for Operation Barbarossa, the continued operations, the Gedob lacks the sufficient locomotives. So, for instance, on January 1942, the army requests 130 trains a day, but the Gedob can only provide 80. So they're 50 trains short. Right, so Operation Barbarossa. So, okay. So it's unique in the operation, operation in the annals of the German army, not just for its size and its scope, but because it broke all the norms of German logistics. So the railway issues are, General Gurkha has issues with the Deutsche Reichsbahn arising from the French campaign. General Gurkha in the spring of 1941 hopes to solve these by creating his own military railway operational service called the 
Feld Eisenbahn Commander, or Fedco. We saw him on the map earlier. And he uses 50,000 Deutsche Reichsbahn staff called up for military service. They're called the Grey Eisenbahner. So the idea is the railways will be repaired by the Eisenbahn pioneer operating in the army rear area, right behind the front line. And then they would hand over to the Fedco to operate in the army rear area, in the rear of the, uh, in the rear area. And that when they move forward, they would then hand over to the RVDs in the Reich's commissariats. The Eisenbahn plan is to change the gauge of the main lines behind the armies from the five foot Soviet Union gauge to the four foot eight and a half gauge used across Europe and to keep within 75 mile range that the lorry columns can cover. Now most of the gross transport room it, it's 60,000 tons that's being used to support the panzer groups. There's a little bit allocated to the armies, but nothing like what they need. They really do need the railways to keep up with them if they're going to keep going with their advance. And although 60,000 tonnes sounds a lot of lift for the gross transport room, remember that's equivalent to delivering just 15,000 tonnes a day at 600 kilometres depth into the uh, Soviet Union. And that really is just about enough to keep the 25 um, Panzer divisions and the motorized divisions uh, with fuel and ammunition. There's nothing really uh, equivalent to that. The second lot of uh, issues is the command issues. These stem from the structure of the German logistics. So the railways are under command of General Gurkha. That's an OKW position. Logistics are under command of General Wagner, and that's an OKH position. And he handles everything from the railhead onwards. Um, now, although he's got the strategy, the gross transport room, that's given to the Panzers, um, he's also trying to get around the fact that he doesn't really want the railways involved in this at all because he sees them as a bit of a as a bit of a, a liability so he's going to try and do it with, with, with using as much motor transport as he can so the command split doesn't really work and there's other issues with the command as well because they don't really mesh together terribly well so the railways deal in um train loads and train loads are 350 tons that's what a German military train carries. The army operate with their lorry columns. And no matter how you split it up, the train loads that they deliver don't necessarily match the army columns that arrive. Mm. So you could never, you always end up with either stuff left behind or part of the army column is not filled. So there's basic problems like that. Um, the other thing we have to consider is what are the Soviets doing in their occupied part of Poland? Because that's going to play a role as well. Now, the Soviets are very busy. They're moving 2.6 million troops forward because they've taken over this area. And they're also moving the fixed defences of the Stalin line forward. And also the NKVD is very busy because it's executing around 150,000 Poles and it's deporting 800,000 800, other ones to Siberia and Kazakhstan to internal exile. And some of them go into the Gulag, but the vast majority is put into internal exile. And uh, this affects all the indigenous Poles in the region. So they leave in place the Jews, um, they leave in place the Ruthenes. The other thing they've got to deal with, of course, is under the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the Soviet Union is delivering strategic materials to Germany. And this has to come by rail. So that's going through this area as well. So all, what happens is that all of these upgrade plans that the Soviets produce never happen because the railways are too busy at the time to start shutting down to do repairs and upgrades. 
So the first time we see any plans for upgrades is around February 1941. But other than changing a few gauges, really nothing has been done. And they've got plenty of Polish rolling stock. So a lot of the Cressy is still left in its four foot, eight and a half inch gauge. A lot of it's left with Polish rolling stock. And in fact, there's not much change in the Polish gap at all. So Operation Barbarossa. So, right. So the planning for Operation Barbarossa was done by the commander of the 8th Army, General Marx. And General Wagner stated at the time of the planning that he could support a slightly smaller army than it actually took place, 600 kilometers deep into the Soviet Union. So because of this, the German high command envisages six encirclement battles, three on the border to destroy the border armies, and then three 300 kilometers into the Soviet Union to destroy the Soviet reserve armies. Now in 1941, Harris Group Nord and Mitter both succeed, but Harris Group Sud fails. It doesn't destroy the, German, the Soviet armies. They go to the other side of the Dnieper, in the air around Kiev. The second round of battles happen. Harris Group Nord, Nord succeeds, gets to Leningrad. Harris Group Mitter fails at Smolensk. It doesn't destroy the armies at Smolensk. They escape. And so it's left with not, not a lot in the way of success. Um, so to correct this, they do, as everyone knows, they then mount a, a further operation, which is coming down from the Army Group Center area and comes behind the Soviet armies in Kiev and conducts the biggest encirclement of the war. That means we've now sort of done five of the six encirclements, but we still haven't done the one in the center. So Operation Typhoon represents an additional encirclement. It's beyond the range of listed logistical support because it's more than 600 kilometers from the border. And it's outside the original time frame of the, of the operation. So this is very much an ad hoc operation. So this is produces what's called the winter crisis of 1941. For Operation Typhoon, the months delay whilst the action is happening down in the south doesn't improve the supply situation at all. The supply districts at Minsk and Orsha remain empty. The troops lack replacements. There's no replacement weapons. There's no. There's only one or two divisions get through as re reinforcements. And the winter uniforms remain in depots in Poland. Why has this happened? Well, the answer is the Eisenbahn pioneer have changed the gauge. But the Soviet, NK, the Soviet NKPS, which is the Soviet Railways, are all people who served in the Civil War, and they know exactly how to fight a railway war, and they've blown up everything. It's a scorched earth policy. They've blown up the engine sheds, they've blown up the locomotives they had to leave behind, and the holes, and they uh, dismantled the signal system. But all the eyes and pan dynamics changed the gauge. They've changed the gauge. They're very pleased with themselves. They've kept up with the armies advancing. Um, but the railways are only running on six trains a day down any given railway line. So the problem is when winter hits, what happens is there isn't, there's been no upgrade of the railways. Replacement railways um, are, for replacement engines are sent from Germany and France but they fall out of service because there's no engine sheds to put them in. And this eventually starts to affect the Deutsche Reichsbahn and the economy. So by 1942, by February 1942, 70% of the engines are out of service in Russia. They didn't have enough engines to start with, but now most of them are out of service. So on the 15th of January, Hitler hands management of the railways over to Dorfmüller. It's been with the army. It goes over to Dorfmüller now. The army are really upset about this. And that's the reason why in April, they arrest two leading RVD officials, Eugene Hahn and Landsberger, and put them in concentration, give them to Gestapo as traitors. They're put in a concentration camp. 
Dorpmüller visits Hitler's office every month until they're released. Every time he meets Hitler, he says, what about my two guys in the concentration camp? So, uh, 1942. Dorpmüller... Do you want to, I'll do a round of questions here because they're, they're yes, building up. Right. So, um, some are, so let's go. I'll take them kind of in reverse order. So, um, World War II analyzes a few points. One is, I don't get how Typhoon is beyond the range of logistical support. It worked biggest encirclement in history. So, but, you, but you're saying it is beyond, is it beyond easy logistical support? Yeah, I mean, Wagner states quite clearly in the planning, 600 kilometers. And they get no extra support brought up during the month's delay. So when they launch Typhoon, they're launching with the same troops, a handful of reinforcements, no replacements, no replacement weapons, no real replacement supplies either, no winter uniforms. None of that's brought up. And the reason it's not brought up is because it, it's the railways are required to bring it up and the railways are still operating as the Eisenbahn Pioneer produced which is well, only six or 12 trains a day because the Fedco and the RVDs, they're just operational staff. Literally, when the RVD um, re comes to Minsk, it's 60 railwaymen. They don't even have typewriters and they've got to start running the railway. And they're just guys who stand on stations and, you know, direct trains and do timetabling. They're not heavy engineering units to start building up the track. So you've got the low capacity strip during in the Poland, in the eastern part of Poland, and then you've got this destroyed railway ahead of that. And this can't carry any kind of level of traffic forward. It's the kind that you need. In 1944, uh, an army group would require 120 trains a day. Well, they're getting nothing like that. If they're getting 20 trains a day, they're lucky. Okay, thanks. And um, he's also asking, um, you know, when you talk about the 50,000 conscripted uh, into the uh, Fedco, did that include the EBP, he's saying? No, the Eisenbahn pioneer. No, it doesn't. They are in the Grau Eisenbahn, uh, Eisenbahner are literally railway workers put in a uniform and told, go and stand over there. You're going to be running railways up in Russia next month. Okay, thanks. And he's also it's saying very that basic. That Remember, this is in April. They're doing all this in yeah. April. They don't think about it till April. And you, you talked about the Operation Otto. And said, do we know the approximate Reichsmark cost of Operation Otto? Because it's going back a few slides. Not off the top of my head, no. But I a can lot, look it up I'm assuming. <laughs> and one from Pro, uh, Pront SC. Were the Italians involved in the access trains moving uh, moved due east? Um... Not not in Barbarossa, no, no, and they're not running any railways. The only people involved in railways are the Romanians, because the Romanians remember take over that strip of land Transistria that runs down to Odessa, and they actually run the railways there, but they have German officers from uh Gurkha's organization uh organizing the train, the uh troop movements. Okay, thank you. And then Rob Crane was asking much earlier about coal or wood and did it change as they went east or back to, so can you just kind of address that um who who's i well i well anything i mean the, the basically the german the german yeah. railways in in this in, in what we've been talking about are they predominantly well, german coal? railway trains run on coal soviet railway trains run on coal wood anything really um so as, they move east. So as the, again as they move east yeah they should have been bringing the coal with them because they're not going to find coal and the, the supply in the soviet union would have been disrupted anyway by the war so they're only going to find relatively small amounts of coal so they should have been bringing coal up and that's of course another issue is of your 20 trains a day some of those trains are going to be used to run the railway itself so um that that makes makes a difference. About a fifth of the traffic is a, is for the actual running of the railway itself, not just carrying cargo. Okay, well, thanks. And and he's saying Hitler actually said the Italian troops weren't worth the added stress on the railways. Uh, no comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, that's that's a little flurry of questions. There might be some more later, and I'll go back and address. But I'll hand it back to you. 
Yeah, no, that's fine. You know, it's a big subject, and we're having to condense it right down. I'm just trying to give a sort of overview picture. Yeah. Okay, that's the idea. Uh, so where have we got to? 42. Yep. yep. So, okay, so Dortmund tours the railways to see what's got to be done. And he actually starts a rebuilding program, particularly in the Polish Gap. And to do that, he does what they should have done in the first place. He brings German railway co engineering companies, heavy engineering companies, in to um, Russia and increases them. There have been one or two. Uh, and this is a funny story, which I, I found uh, in, in the archives, is that there's this outrage letter in 1941, in, in about July, this German engineering company's come all the way from, from the Ruhr to build, rebuild the main bridge over the uh, Dnieper River. And they arrive and they set up shop. And then an officer arrives from the Eisenbahn Pioneer and says, golly, that's a nice kit you've got there. I'm, I'm requisitioning that load it onto my train and off he went and they left there sinking in a field with no equipment and he writes this outraged letter to the uh, to the officer to the head of the eisenbahn pioneer saying we, we've come all the way from germany to rebuild this bridge your guys are rebuilding some other bridge down down the track somewhere they've stolen all our equipment what do you expect us to do about it um right okay so um the thaw comes in april and the Stalingrad campaign starts at the end of June. So Dortmund has only got a very, he's got a couple of months to assemble the men and materials and try and build up the railways for the campaign. And he has three programs in the East. He has the Ostbau program, which is addresses the capacity in the Polish gap to a large extent. You'll see them working in, in the areas um, that were formerly Poland. Late 42, there is a second program called Winter Ostbau, which is to rebuild the engine sheds and the depots so they can survive the winter. And then there's the Ostbau 43 program, which upgrades the routes east of the occupied areas in uh, Poland. Um, However, then this is an important point. The Deutsche Reichsbahn is building up a German style railway. So they have high speeds, they have uh, they have um, high speeds, high spec track, low labor input. So it's a massive task. And they, un they fail to understand how Soviet railways are so successful and they fail to understand how the Soviets run their railways. So this should be slide 24. Yes, it is. So what's the historiography of this? So as we've discussed before, earlier on, the Foreign Military Studies program interviews German uh, generals, and you can read about them, I think, on a website called Fold3. Mm -hmm. And they're all there to download, and you can read about them. The ones we're looking at largely are in the P series. Um, right. So how much can we trust what the German generals say? Because basically what they say is, oh, the Soviets, they had a different gauge. They took us by completely by surprise. They chose the mean of defense, and it was successful. The Soviet railways, they're constructed of very low standards, softwood sleepers, plain spikes in the hold, and the rails are really lightweight. Soviet railway engines, they're really big. They're much longer range than German ones. Basically, they're saying it's not our fault. Have to, we have to ask the question, is that true? Especially as Van Kriefeld and Schuler use much of this data for their accounts. And here's a clue. How can you run a heavy engine, a heavier than German engine than Germans use on low grade track? Well, more wheels helps spread the load. Slow speed helps. But ultimately, you can't do it. So somewhere their story doesn't quite add up. Right. It's a bit sensitive, this thing, isn't it? So next we're going to look at um, Operation Barbarossa, the problems with the narrative. So we're going to talk now about what the Germans refer to as the low technical standard of Soviet railways. 
Our main source from this is the gentleman on the right hand side, whose name is Holland Hunter, who's an American economist. So why is their account wrong? Well, one of the reasons is, is that Soviet railways are actually one of the best railways in the world, especially in, in the 1930s and 40s. The level of track utilization matches that in the United States, but they're very different. The USA uses high levels of mechanization to carry a huge freight traffic. And that's because they have unionized labor, which is very expensive. So they've invested capital in machines to replace labor. The Soviet Union is very similar. In fact, they're based on, so, on American railways. Only they're short of capital. So they use low technical standards and they compensate for this by having masses of cheap labor for frequent maintenance. If we want to make a comparison, the Soviet railways are sort of equivalent to the US railways in 1900. They're about 30 or 40 years behind the curve. They do have a few really high technical standard tracks equivalent to American tracks. They're called Uber Magistrale, which means that they carry just a single commodity. And they carry 30% of the Soviet Union's tonnage on just 10% of the track. And an example of that is the Karaganga coalfield route to Magnitogorsk, which is all in the Urals. It's 1,200 kilometers long. It matches this huge coal field with this huge iron ore field where they, where they smelt the iron ore. It uses 3,000 ton trains, which are unheard of in Germany. The rest of the network is pretty basic and it runs very slowly, but it all runs at one speed. And that's important for track utilization because it means there's no passing. Normally what happens, a goods train will have to get out of the way of a passenger train, passenger train will have to pull into a siding to get out of the way of an express train. They all suffer delays. But if everyone's running at the same speed, there's no delays anywhere. And so you get high levels of traffic. So how it works is it fills the tracks it's got with large, slow trains, which retrieve very high traffic levels on a limited length of track. The Germans don't understand this. It has to be said that some other railway commentators in Europe, such as the Polish experts, don't understand this either. So it's not. But um, they really don't understand this. OK, the second claim is that German locomotives are not suited to Russian conditions. Any German, the German claim is they're not suitable for the network. Well, I'll give you two examples here. We've got a, um, a standard freight engine, the E-Class, and we've got the typical Prussian engine, the G10. And as you can see, they're pretty similar. Now, the Soviet one does carry more water. It can go further. But there's not big differences between them. They're pretty similar. And then the next one is the um, lack of Soviet information on Soviet railways. So during the planning period for the Operation Barbarossa, the staff officers at OKH asked the Deutsche Reichsbahn for information on the Soviet network. The Deutsche Reichsbahn had not collected the timetables or social layout, so they were unable to help. And that's because the Soviet Union was never identified as a potential enemy. However, there's actually lots of information in the Western world about Soviet railways. Because starting in the 1920s, the Soviets had used railways as an, example, as an example of the achievements of Soviet labor and socialism. So they were quite uh, open with it all. There were books and magazines published. An American railway president was invited for an inspection tour. And German firms were tendering to build locomotives for the Soviet Union. The most interesting case is that of Dr. Otto Wieder Texter. He's an American, he's a sorry, a German railway academic who lives in Minsk. And he regularly writes articles for the academic journal Archive der Eisenbahn, which is the house Germany of the Railway Association of European Railway Companies. And you can read this, it's in, held in the British Library. And even using this 1930s material, you can get a reasonably clear picture of the Soviet railways. They were just never asked. Okay, so the next one is controversial. Right, so no, it's not. Right, okay, so changing the gauge was a big task, and I'm con conscious we're overrunning at the minute. So let's look at some historical examples of changing the gauge 
and all these operating across different gauges to see what the effect will. Um, so let's first of all kill the myth that the Soviet gauge was chosen for defensive purposes. The first German, sorry, the first Russian railway was built in 1837 from St. Petersburg to the Tsar's Summer's Palace. It was six foot. The next one was Warsaw to Vienna. That was four foot eight because that had to connect with, with the Austrian railways. The third one built was Moscow to St. Petersburg. It was built by an American engineer, Major Whistler. He's father of the painter. And he built it in five foot gauge because he came from the southern United States where they used a five foot gauge. Mm. Now, examples of armies operating across different gauges. American Civil War, the Union Army operates across five foot eight and five foot gauges in the Confederate States. Do we have any howls of protest from the Americans? No, they seem to manage it quite happily. 1871, the USA still has, despite lots of standardization, 23 different gauges. Still running a railway happily. 1878, the Russians operate across a five foot and a four foot eight inch gauge in the Austro in, in the Russo Turkish War. And the ro remaining railways are terribly low capacity. They actually construct two fully working railway lines in five foot eight gauge, 65 kilometers long and 305 kilometers in 58 days. Here's the, here's the killer though. 1866, the Confederate network is converted from standard gauge of five foot to, to, to the standard gauge of four foot eight and a half. 18,000 kilometers and all the rolling stock changed in just 36 hours. Wow. 1892, the Great Western Railway, of course, changes from a seven foot gauge to four foot eight. They do it over weekends. The last section on the weekend of the 21st to 22nd of May, 275 kilometers changed by 4,200 plate layers from Paddington to Penzance, one weekend. Changing the gauge is not a big problem. The other, this is the one that cracks me up though, is 1917, the Baldwin Locomotive Company is left with 200 Russian E-class locomotives on a five foot gauge. And the Tsar's gone bust, the Tsar's uh, in prison and they're stuck with them. What do they do? Do they scrap them? Well, you know, they can't chain. No, all they do is take the tires off change the tires to ones that are one and three quarters wider, and then they sell them to US railway companies and they're running on US railway companies. Even changing locomotives over to the gauge, if you plan for it, if you've got some ideas about it, is relatively simple. And of course the killer is 1943 to 1945, the Red Army changes back to a five foot gauge and they're not complaining either. The mm. only people in history seemingly complaining about gauge change are the Germans in 1941. Even their grandfathers in Poland in 1915 didn't complain about it. So I'm saying if you're prepared for it and you plan for it, it's not a big engineering challenge. You just need to be prepared. So the new interpretation, and I'm not coping with this button here, I'm too cack-handed. So, um, so the new interpretation is the German advance successful. Gross transport room supports the Panzer groups. The railways support the armies. A limited service just bringing up ammunition and fuel. The Eisenbank changed the gauge, keeping within seven days the armies. Very limited service. They have converted 16,000 kilometers of track before the Battle of Smolensk. That's a report from the Eisenbank commander to headquarters. Franz Halder correctly identifies the problem in his diary. He identifies that the Eisenbahn Pioneer are only performing basic repairs. They're not rebuilding signaling. They're not rebuilding the engine depots and the other tra track infrastructure. So they're not raising the capacity of the railways. So lack of capacity. Lack of capacity means that only munitions and fuel reach the front. No reinforcements. No winter clothing. The gross transport room realm starts to break down. By August, 75% of the lorries 
are on the trains going back to Germany for repair. There are problems between the transport service and supply service, and there are problems between the transport service, the Eisenbahn Pioneer, the Fedco, and the RVD. It's a total mess. So, Van Krefeld and Schuler used the military accounts and believed everything the generals told them. So I would argue these are now rather dated. Using railway sources such as Eugene Hahn and the information we've seen today, so it's a very different story. It's a lack of preparation. It's a lack of commitment by the Deutsche Reichsbahn to the campaign. And that all stems from Dortmund's original decision in 1939 in Poland to start setting up these little railway companies because they can't cope. And the Otto plan shows they can't cope. And a lot of the army's grandiose plans for logistics, such as the supply districts and the Fedco, are not matched in reality by tangible support. The Fedco is a good idea for running the railways, but they're only set up in April 1941, and they've got no equipment. There's no engineering involved here. The same with the RVDs. And there's very little involvement until 1942 of the Deutsche Reichsbahn. They're all expecting to take over a functioning railway just as in 1940. And that's really where we come to the conclusion that it's the actions of the NKPS really scupper the German plans. By blowing up the railways, dismantling the communication systems, they denied the Germans their logistical support and that denied them the victory for operation typhoon mm. That's it. well brilliant stuff so to kind of summarize that in my limited capacity way um lack of preparation and then the soviet you know attacks on it as well not helping and then bad weather compounding things and then infighting compounding that and kind of a perfect storm but um yeah. Yeah, they couldn't. They couldn't have done any worse with the railways, really. Um, that's the problem. They really needed to get their act together because it's such big distances. But they tried it to to cobble it together with using motorization. You know, the army guys who are doing the logistics thought motorization would solve the problem. They didn't pay attention to the railways because that was an OKW command area, and the OKW are, are not really focused on the logistics either. So. And nobody's talking to the railways. The railways want to do what they do in Germany. And so they'll leave it to these little railway companies that really aren't set up for managing this kind of problem at all. And it's all down to engineering. You, need, you needed the engineering support to go in there. And it, I reckon if they'd sent in the, you know, the full power of the German industry to support the railways after the advance, Typhoon would have had a very different outcome because they would have had replacements, replacement weapons, they'd have had more supplies, more fuel. And, you know, a lot of the problems they encountered during Typhoon wouldn't have happened. It was really an operation they were trying to run beyond their logistical reach. Mm. So even, but even you're saying even by 1942, they're recognizing their own failings themselves. And so if they that, that if they had recognized that in advance, predicted it, basically, then they would have not had these problems. And then there, there's little, people are making little comments about the fact that, um, Kevin Jones has been asking all, all through the, the the show about the different signaling systems. Is that is that ever an issue moving from different areas and different companies, or is that when when you when you've got a war situation, it's kind of one overriding system take over? No, because the the Germans were very good at sort of meshing all this stuff together. So yeah, they do have different signaling systems. Um, and there, there would have been problems. You can work through these sort of technical problems if you put enough people on it. Yeah, so just it's it just a lack of planning and not enough people and not enough of the right skilled people, I guess, is what we're saying. Yeah, as well, but you it? know, yeah. fifty thousand guys standing there in a uniform and a pair of boots with no equipment at all and just some, you know, and told to get on with it is, is it literally the sum total of the German army's attempt? The Grey Eisenbahn pioneer is not cut out for what they're asked to do, um, and neither the RVDs either. I mean, Hahn describes how. He arrives in Minsk. He's got hasn't even got a typewriter. It's just sixty guys living in a shed on the platform, and then he finds they start putting together the uh, the timetables, and then he finds a printing press, four color printing press. Great, right? We can now print the timetables. 
Next day, the SS take the Jewish printing staff out and shoot them all. Wow. And um, they said, you know, we can't operate this printing press. We, you know, it's not, you know, so it doesn't happen. It, it really is, you know, nobody's paying attention to this. The railways are somebody else's problem. That's really the problem with the whole campaign is the railways are somebody else's problem. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's always someone else who should be sorting this out and therefore it's not being sorted out at all. Well, uh, I, I always say a good show means that we end up having more questions at the end of it than we do when we started, which just means we'll bring you back for part two and look about Stalingrad and answer some of the questions that came up in this show. But yeah, that that it's been it's been quite as always. It's been mind blowing, and I've got a lot to think about. So um, thank you for thank you for joining us. Um, it's yeah, been great. I'm sorry, it's been a bit of a gallop through an enormous subject, and you know, there's lots of interesting detail there. But uh, you know, at least it's given you like an overview. Yeah, and we're yeah. Sorry, we can we can do a deeper dive later on. So, folks, hmm. it's two shows tomorrow. We've got one on the economy, how the Japanese manage things in Southeast Asia, and then we have one with Daniel Taylor coming on talking about the crossing of the Voltorno River in Italy by um, the 4th County of London Yeomanry. So two shows coming your way tomorrow, and a railways one on Wednesday. So thanks, Hugh. Thanks, everybody. I will see you all again next time. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Thank you.